Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Headstrong, a podcast where I sit down with someone in the public eye to chat to them about their life and the vulnerabilities that they have experienced along the way that have helped shape them who they are. This week's episode is with Vanessa Bauer. We sat down together to talk about Vanessa's journey to becoming a pro on Dancing on Ice and her brave decision to speak out about eating disorders, as well as dealing with unwarranted criticism from others in life and on social media. Uh, Thank you, Vanessa Bauer, for coming to speak to me today on Headstrong, the podcast. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to speak here. Yeah, so this is your first podcast. It's my first podcast. I've always wanted to do a podcast, so I'm really excited about this one. Well, we are absolutely honoured to have you here. Um, So you've just finished Dancing on Ice Series 2. I did. Pretty awesome. Your second series, you came second. First one, you came first. What, 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 What next? Well, I mean, um, the series just finished, so it was two incredible series, and I really enjoyed both of them. Like you said, the first one I won, second one came second. I think it went all right, really. (laughs) And, um, I mean, two incredible experiences, and who knows, maybe another third season? Yeah, signed the dotted line yet? Oh, I'm not saying anything. Uh, No spoilers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, so I've got to ask you the question: Who who was the better skater? Who did you? Which series did you enjoy more? Well, I did really enjoy both series. However, I felt more comfortable in my second series because I kind of knew everybody already. Like the team was um, all together. Everybody knew what they were doing, what their job was like, and um, I also felt like um, I was more accepted by the team for who I am as well. Because like my first series, I felt a little bit pressured as well. I thought that. Well, also you were only you were really young as well yeah, coming in. Yeah, like I was twenty one in my first series. I just turned twenty one in my first series I was by far the youngest pro I didn't know any of the other pro skaters didn't know anybody in the team I didn't even speak English really well like yeah. that was my thing like when I came to England I was quite nervous because I thought that I was not going to be able to understand everybody because of the accents as well and um, yes yeah, so it was really hard for me at the beginning to like find my spot or find my place mm. in the show and um, yeah, so my second series, I was way more relaxed and I loved everybody. We were such a family and it was just so comfortable to be around everybody. And I really had a good time. You really got that familiar- familiarity back yeah. and just kind of settled in. That's really nice. I yeah, guess. It so, does it, is it a bit of a family kind of feeling when you're all there? Because I suppose you yeah. spend so much time in the studio with yeah. the crew, all the dancers, all the other uh, celebrities and what whatnot. So it's quite probably quite a tight knit group, right? A hundred percent. Like we grow so close together because like I mean um, it's not only the live shows that you're working together so it's not only those 12 weeks or 13 weeks that you see on live TV it's um, all that um, preparation time beforehand as well that you are working really closely together with all the celebs not only with your own celebrity but with all the other celebs as well Mm. you work so closely with um, all the other pro skaters too and you really develop like good friendships for life as well during that show and kind of the people that you work together they are your family because you're with them literally 24 7 every single day for like six months so it's very intense and um yeah and it's great when you get along and when you just find really good friends that you can trust as well you said just before we were recording that you don't really want to talk about this stuff and i don't really want to talk about it either but it kind of dominated the headlines so to speak during the series with um, it wasn't necessarily to do with you, but with Wes and Megan. Um, do you have what do you what do you what kind of happened, or do you not really want to talk about it at all? <laughs> I mean, it's now um, quite a while after the show, yeah. so you kind of like get a different um, view about what has actually happened during the show because obviously during the show you are I was so focused on my work and for me my work always comes first and I'm so professional and I don't let anything like privately affect my um my my profession on the show and my professionalism on the show as well so um I kind of just rejected everything that guy like, came towards me from the press, from the media, from the trolls online, because it didn't have anything to do with what I was hired for on Dancing on Ice. Like, I'm a professional figure skater, and I'm there to choreograph the routines and to teach Wes and to, yeah, to come up with cool routines and be a professional figure skater on the show. And it's not my job to, like display my private life and discuss my private life. You touched on it briefly there with 
the press coverage, obviously, because you're being talked about in the headlines in a way that you don't think is right, but obviously you've dealt with it so professionally. But then you've also got the the social media aspect of it with not only um, the trolls, but also Megan herself, like, yeah. kind of, you know, coming out at you. And how does it feel, like, to be, I don't know, singled out as the, that, the bad person in what's going on when you might not necessarily are? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was very, very difficult at the beginning. I didn't let anybody show how difficult it actually was the first, like, two, three weeks. Because I've never, like you said, I've never dealt with anything like that before. Yeah. And, um, I mean, when the first headlines came up and, like, I just broke up with my boyfriend that I was with for, like, three years. Like, we were living together for two and a half years. It was very intense. And then, like, and then people forget about that and they are just like, oh, like... She, she broke up with him because she wants to get with Wes. And I was like, what the hell? Like, people don't even know anything about me. Like, how, where do all these assumptions come from? And then, like, Megan made this very bad story about me. And I remember exactly when I was in the, I was in the pros room and I was actually just discussing that with another pro skater. And I was talking about how upset I was about Lewis's and my breakup, who was my ex-boyfriend. Mm. And then I opened my phone and I saw the story mentioned from Megan and I was like what I just met her yesterday and I like we just introduced each other and we were like talking to each other nicely and then all of a sudden this comes out of nowhere and I was like so shocked and then all this like all the um like the past the next weeks after that it was just everything about this one story and I think that was so upsetting because I really really focused on my job and I really tried to make my job as good as possible and people were like kind of forgetting about the skating aspect. Yeah. yeah, it was really upsetting. But then I realized like it was all just happening literally on my phone. Like yeah. all these comments from all these trolls from people that I don't even know that don't know anything about me. They were just happening on my phone, on Instagram or like the Daily Mail online, the Sun online. Uh, and yeah. it was just like, well, if I just switch off my phone, this is kind of not actually happening. Because with Wes and I, everything was just completely fine. There was never a moment of awkwardness mm. or we never like I mean obviously we discussed it at the beginning but like we never like raised our voice against each other and we had like we were really really good friends as well and um, so that was never a problem ever you've answered my next question how would you deal with it that's brilliant so there was this one moment actually which was quite funny. It was, um, I think, the first week of um, the live shows of Dancing on Ice when literally my phone just blew up and there was just notifications popping up of people like, oh, you're the reason why Megan and Wes are going to break up. And I'm like, oh my God, I just don't want to do anything. Like, I just I just want to do my job. And I, it really affected me at the beginning. And then I went for a run outside and my phone died. So my battery died and I basically couldn't like check my phone anymore and then I like looked around and I was like um I was going on a for a run on this canal where I live and I was like looking around and I was like oh it's actually a really nice day and tomorrow I'm gonna go on the ice and like I'm gonna skate and it's gonna be amazing and like for an hour when I was running I didn't have any notifications popping up and I was just happy and it was just fine and so I realized, well, this is really just happening on the phone. And really, this be these people that are doing, that are actually commenting on my um, pictures in a bad way. They really don't know anything about me. Like, they've never met me before. So I really shouldn't care about what they think because I know who I am and my friends know who I am and the people that I work with know who I am and it doesn't matter what they say. So, yeah. Just Would you say phone. that you're addicted to your phone or social media? Yeah, I feel like um, it's really easy nowadays to become addicted to social media and to your phone and like to constantly check what people think about your latest post or you post something and you want to just see like, oh, are these comments good or do they like my post or do they not? And it really doesn't matter. You yeah, know? exactly. Like, That's what I always think. It just as well. does not matter. Like, if you want to post something, post it and and. If you don't, then that's fine as well. And I mean, it's social media and the real world is still out there. And I think nowadays it's so hard to like, to like take your phone away from you and just like enjoy the real life, if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, just like in your run where you are actually living in the here yeah. and the now, enjoying life around you, yeah. the real life, not the yeah. online world. Yeah, I mean, it's a good display for yourself and you can like show your profession as well. It's a good you platform. Can use, yeah, it's a good, it's a very good platform to portray yourself to the public. Um, however, 
it's not all about the social media and you should still know who you are outside of the social media world and like know who your friends are and know who you can trust and not only like like think about oh my god this influencer he just commented on my post and it's so cool like and he's got a tick and it's like even more amazing and he commented on me like oh does it actually really matter this like stupid blue tick that somebody has on their social media platform and I don't know it's just so weird sometimes yeah I suppose that is what that is the problem nowadays that some people do just aspire to have that yeah. I read an interview the other day it's where people were asked asking young children what, what do you want to be when you grow up and they go oh, I want to be famous but they don't want to be a figure skater. They don't want to be a rugby player. They don't want to be uh, an influencer. They want to be famous. So there's a difference nowadays of um, what one aspires to be, which yeah. is quite interesting. Um, so dancing on ice over done. Let's we can tuck that under the table. Um, <laughs> so before dancing on ice, you were working on cruise ships. That's pretty I was. cool. And so you must have toured for like I don't know months, surely. Going around. Yeah, I mean, I was on cruise ships for two and a half years. No way. So, yeah, I had the best time of my life as well. I mean, in England, sometimes people are like, oh, you work on cruise ships? That's weird. Mm. Um, but I honestly did have the best time of my life. I, you travel around the world, and especially as a figure skater, you get treated so well. Like, you have your shows at night, and you perform for your audience, and you, again, do what you love, what I'm so passionate about, figure skating in the spotlight for an amazing crowd who is appreciating what you do on the ice, what you've worked for your entire life as well. Um, so for me, it was really a dream job when I came on cruise ships and... Um, Every day you wake up at a different place, really, in the Caribbean or somewhere in the Mediterranean, and you just get to enjoy your life and literally see the whole world. Like, I've seen so many countries, and it's not only that you people are like, oh, well, you don't really get time to, like, actually explore, but you do get time to explore and to actually enjoy your life. So I had a really good time. Yeah. I met my ex-boyfriend there, who I was with for three years, who I openly had to break up with. <laughs> yeah, oh. like, so is that is that finito? Oh, yeah, that's fine. That's, is it? that's done. He's back on cruise ships now. Is he? He's loving his life, yeah. Okay, well, that's good. Well, at least yeah. you guys, I assume you guys are civil now. That's good, at least. Yeah, I mean, that's I'm totally always cool. like, I'm an easy person. Yeah. I don't like to get into any fights with anybody. Like, I'm easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, before you got onto the cruise ships, then, I guess you had to discover ice skating itself. Yeah. Let's go back right to the beginning, then. Um, how did you first skate? Or how did you first think, oh, this is actually what I want to do? I mean, um, I started figure skating when I was four years old. So wow. Obviously, at four years, um, you don't really know what's going on. So I don't really remember what exactly I obviously thought. I probably didn't even think anything except for, oh, that's so cool, like gliding on the ice. And I like have to push and then I'm on the other side of the ring or whatever. Um, but for me, it was my parents who took me on a public ice session and they never ever wanted me to do a competitive sport ever because um, my parents, they were also... So I come from a very poor family, so my parents never had any money to afford anything in my uh, when I was a little kid in my teenage life or just any time in my life, really. So um, when my father took me to this public ice session, we just wanted to skate for fun, and it was just like a normal day out. And then there was this Russian coach who saw me, and she immediately saw some kind of potential in me. And she reached out to my dad and she asked whether I can, like, take any private lessons for her, like, from her. So, but then, um, yeah, my, my dad, he obviously said, no, well, we can't afford that. You're not going to be a figure skater ever. And she, it was like destiny. She just thought, no, well, she's a very talented young girl and I want to teach her and I want her to become a figure skater and I want her to, to explore this amazing world of figure skating. And so she just taught me for free. No way. She taught me for free, yeah. And that was from the age of four? From the age of four, just because she saw something in me and she wanted to make a figure skater out of me, and she really did. And then, um, yeah, I just kept, like, training so hard and hard because I immediately... Um, I immediately started to appreciate, obviously, that she's teaching me for free and that it's a privilege and that I have to take, um, that I can't take that for granted that she's doing that for me. So I really, really worked hard. And um, then it wasn't really um, a long time until the National Federation started to sponsor me and I became part of the national team. And so what age was that at? Um, that was like 
at nine already when they started no way. sponsoring God, that's me. So young, yeah. Too. So they started sponsoring me as a single skater. And then they decided about um I could be a good pair skater and then it put me into pair skating and then everything started. Had you ever done any pair skating? Well, I suppose you're at nine or ten, that's quite difficult because I suppose you're doing lifts and stuff and you've got this poor, yeah. I don't know, poor young man trying to lift, I don't know, lifting at age of 10. That's quite challenging, I guess. Um, I mean, I wasn't 10 when I started pair skating. That so was 13. When they, yes, I was 13 when I started pair skating. And um, yeah, so that was quite interesting because I've always wanted to do some sort of pair skating. Like I've always wanted to know what it's like to to be lifted over the ice not only to glide on the ice but actually like being lifted over the ice or like being thrown around and I always thought it was really cool and so when my coach um, said that I would have a really good chance as a pair skater for Germany internationally I was super excited and there was this one pair guy who was open as well for um, for tryouts so we tried out and it worked out really well and then everything started and I became a pair skater and competed internationally so and does that count as a professional by that point then at 13 yeah, you were professionally I mean, skating yeah I think 13 14 was like my peak in my competitive career which is quite young. I know it's quite weird in the skating world, but you peak really young and then, um, yeah, that kind of goes downhill after. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about that then. What, I, what what happened with, I don't know, was it a coach or a friend or somebody who said something to you that yeah. triggered something that happened to you? I mean, for me, it was on my very first day of tryouts with this new pass guy, Um so basically, we had the first day of tryouts, and I was so excited for it. And I told my friend, oh, my God, I'm going to be lifted now by this guy, and he seems really strong, and I'm like so excited to be lifted over the ice. And then she, like, took that joy away from me immediately. Like, I mean, it was one of my best friends, and I don't think she ever had, like, a bad, like, um, um, thought behind it or whatever. Because, I mean, at 13, you don't really know what you're saying, and you don't know how big of an impact this everything that you're saying may have on the life of the this other person but um yeah so she basically told me well yeah well you're going to be lifted so you better be skinny and don't eat anything before that because um everything that you eat he has got to lift uh, above his head and I was like oh well oh that's that's true like he actually he's lifting me so he's also lifting everything that I'm eating and um so she told me I mean it was like a conversation between 13 year olds and um, she just told me well we just had lunch and you are going to do this triad now for the first time and you're gonna let this guy lift you and you just had lunch and I said well yeah but I was hungry and like I usually have lunch at this time like what am I supposed to do not eat and then she was like well yeah you don't eat before you go to your pass session and then I said well so what am I supposed to do now and yeah, and so basically that was like literally a stupid 13-year-old conversation and she told me, well, you know, there's ways to get out. <laughs> and mm. um, so for me it was like not even a thought, like, okay, well, yeah, I'm going to go to the toilet and I'm going to like like force it all out so I'm lighter for my tryout. And so I did it and, um, yeah, it was How did it, how did it make you feel? I mean, for me it was I just wanted to do really well because – since I'm four years, like I always got sponsored from people and I always wanted to make everybody so happy and I always wanted to like satisfy all the people that are actually, um, that are supporting me. So I thought, well, I need to be the lightest for this guy who's going to lift me up. And so I just wanted to do really well. And um, I mean, it made me feel really, obviously it's, it's not natural to do this and I've never done something like that before. Um, but... I just thought at the moment that that was the right thing to do because this was how I was going to be the skinniest or the lightest for this guy who was going to pick me up. So, yeah, that's how it all started. Did it make you feel self-conscious and that's why you did that? Yeah, I mean, um, that was also the first times. I mean, obviously, before that, our coaches, literally from the age of seven, before, because I went to a sports boarding school as well. So um, we are always surrounded by our coaches and my environment was always just really competitive. Mm. And um, 
So our coach would always tell us, oh, you're too fat, like all the time. Since we we're like literally eight, nine, ten year olds, they would tell us we we're too fat. And um, I mean, I never really listened to that because I knew I was not fat and I did all my jumps and I was really good anyways. And I think I really looked good in my costumes and I really loved my sparkly pink dresses for competitions when I was little. And I was really, really confident as well. But then when it came to like being lifted by a guy and I thought, well, it's him who actually needs to do the work if I like if I'm heavy or whatever. And then this coach on top of that as well tells me that I'm fat when I'm 13. And then also my best friend tells me that I need to be skinny, you know. And then there's all these voices that tell you, well, you need to do that so it's easier for this guy. It's kind of, it was really like, I felt like I had to do it. So how long did, I don't know, this, did, were you forcing yourself to be sick until you actually kind of, it got to you so much that you felt that you had to speak out? How long did it go on for? So for me, it literally went on for like um, four years. So I was 13 and at 16, I went into um, professional therapy. So I had psycho, um, psychology. You that? saw a therapist. Yeah, I saw a therapist at 16. And um, nobody would have ever thought that anything was wrong with me the whole time. I mean, it was this one day when my friend told me to do this, but I don't think she ever thought thought that I would like continue doing it and I never told anybody either because I was so embarrassed as well and I thought that but at the beginning I thought it was a really simple solution and for like a half year or so actually not half year for like maybe a couple of weeks I thought oh this is so easy like that's the best diet ever and I actually lost weight and everything and um, people would tell me oh you look really good and you look so fit but then I started to actually hate what I was doing and I started to actually gain weight as well because at 13 I was still a little girl I was I didn't even go through puberty yet and then I started growing and then um, like the number on the scale just went up all the time and our coaches would weigh us all the time in front of everybody so they would call me out and say you need to go on the scale now and then they would tell me oh well see last week you were like zero point two kilogram um, uh, lighter. So how did you like, how did you gain weight so fast? And like in front of everybody. And so for me, yeah, it was really, really horrible for me. And it was a really hard time. And um, it all really got to my head. And I saw that I was actually gaining weight as well. And people would tell me, keep continuing to, to tell me that I was too fat and that I was the reason why my past partner had back problems and things like that. And when I look back now at pictures, I was so skinny. When I was a past kid, <laughs> I was so skinny. And they would still, still say all these things. And I just think it's not right what they did. No. So, um, yeah, so for four years, I really struggled. And, um, and how did you feel when you spoke out about it? To a, even though it was just to a therapist and it wasn't to your friends or family first, but it was to the therapist yeah. at first. You got it all off your chest, I yeah. suppose. And how did that feel? So um, my first my first session with my therapist was horrible. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I could not say a word. Like, Were you scared? I mean, um, yeah, I was really scared. And because for four years, I didn't tell anybody about my struggles. I didn't... I, I was so I appeared so strong. Nobody would have ever known that I was struggling, and um, so speaking about any kind of weaknesses really, really scared me, and I was terrified of it. And I actually couldn't speak. So for the first half year of my therapy, I wasn't even able to speak. Like she knew what my problem was, but the minute um, she wanted me to address that, I just burst out in tears. I was crying, and I've never in my life cried before either like to anybody because I would always be such a strong part like I would always try to like look really strong and like not show any emotion so whenever my coaches tell, told me that I was really bad or like that I was like um that I was fat or that I'm like a bad skater or whatever like the other all the other students would like start crying or like anything but I would never cry so my uh, sessions with my therapist was like the only time that I would just like literally burst out into tears for like a half year I couldn't talk about it. Yeah. So it's crazy. And I never thought, I mean, I'm talking about it now. Yeah. It's just, it's crazy that I'm actually openly talking about it. I mean, I know it's like almost 10 years later 
since it all started. But still, I remember that I said to my therapist, I would never ever in my life tell anybody that I'm actually seeing you here. And also my first years of therapy, I didn't even tell anybody that I was seeing a therapist either. Well, you don't have to either, though. I think that's what people don't forget is you're allowed to keep these things private yeah. because it's confidential with a therapist, yeah. which is really important. But also it's a safe space that you're allowed to be vulnerable and talk about these things. And it's not like the therapist was judging you for crying. You're allowed to go there and use that safe environment to yeah. release what, what's inside you, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and I was struggling a lot. And when I look back at it, um, so many other skaters were actually as well struggling and they never ever seeked out and looked for any help. And they're now my age as well. And like now that I've opened up about it, I get so many messages from friends, even from not even only from strangers on Instagram, but actually like close friends that are telling me that they were struggling as well so much and they were always crying and um, they never told anybody. And they're really happy that that I've actually now spoken out and um, spoken out. And I remember as well when I was um, struggling, if there would have been one single person that I knew as well who had these problems, I would have probably felt a lot better. But I thought I was really by myself. And I thought I was really, really, like I felt guilty for being so weak or vulnerable. And um, yeah, so that's why I think it's really important. I, I was out. looking... Just when I was doing some prep for this, uh, I read that approximately only one in 10 people who suffer from bulimia will ever seek or receive treatment. Yeah. So how important do you think it is to do what you did and actually go and seek, actively seek um, help? Yeah, I think it's one of the most, if not the most important step to actually go out and seek help and actually talk about your problems. And I like, it's a progress. I mean, if you don't feel ready for it, you don't need to rush it either. I mean, it took me, now it's 10 years later, it took me almost a decade to openly speak about it. So it's really a long, long progress. And it took me four years to even like admit that I really have a big problem and that I have to see someone. So, um like, I mean, people may struggle for a year or like two years and they think that there's never a way out of this, but there is eventually. And um, it's it's a long, long progress. And But speaking out is the first step to recovery and to actually healing and to, to also helping other people as well, to making them feel like they're not alone. And um, yeah, so... I can only advise to seek out. I think out. that's really good. Um, for anyone that was interested, Vanessa did a really good blog on Heads Together, the charity. Um, so if anyone wants to read that, go check that out on, online. It's really good. And also you posted a load of Instagrams about it and stuff. And I think yeah. it's so important now that you have the platform that you are talking about this because exactly. I think you've got so many young followers who will who, you know, seek inspiration from you. And I yeah. think you should be really proud of what you're doing. Thank so you. That's really, really good. Um, so how, how, how does it feel now? 10 years on, if you could give any advice to your younger self, what do you, would you have said? Because obviously it went on for four years. What would you have you said to your younger self? Um, I, wrote, I probably would have said to my younger self to just be more confident in who you are and know who you are as well and not only um, think about what others think of you all the time. And I just really wanted to impress everybody and that's really not necessary so much. Like, although you want to be successful and everything, your mental health and your own well-being is still the most important. And um, yeah, you need to be true to yourself as well. And don't just do everything for other people, but for yourself. And um, yeah, just be confident in who you are. How important is fitness to your mental health? Mm. So for me, fitness is a really, really important factor. Like I love going to the gym. I love to go running. And um, that actually helped me a lot to, um, from a recovery from bulimia as well. I mean, um, because for me, people at the beginning um, said, you need to go away from figure skating. You need to go away from any fitness kind of thing. And I didn't do anything for a year, actually. I didn't go running, didn't do anything. And I just got worse and it, I just felt horrible and when I started working out again and I started doing it for myself um, like you can really feel the endorphins like going through your body and you just feel really happy and refreshed after workout so um, I've become a little bit of a fitness addict I love to go to the gym and um, yeah that's how I keep my mental health um, as well 
on track. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's how I'm happy as well. I, you always post um, your skating videos on your Instagram, which is amazing. And I just think, God, that looks exhausting. But then you, yeah. on top of that, you go for runs, you go to the gym as well. You must be seriously fit. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to keep fit. <laughs> I mean, I'm a live TV as well, yeah, like crop up. So, um, yeah, no, but um, I'm not. I'm not doing it to only look good or no. to look fit. I literally, I, I love going to the gym. I love to be active, and that's part of who I am. And um, yeah, I love and it. And so you've got a couple of workouts things online, don't you? So that'd be good if people yeah. want to want to be inspired. Go check it out. Yeah, you can get my abs challenge. Get a six pack as well. And uh, yeah. Um, so w- I have a question. What does the word headstrong mean to you? Headstrong means for me to again be confident with who you are, and um, no matter what other people say. Um, to hold on to your own um, viewpoints and know who you are and don't forget your valuables and don't forget what you think is most important. Don't forget your real life as well. Don't get distracted by social media or any, like, strangers that are um, openly, like, um, d- like trying to slow you down or trying to make your, ha- uh, make your life harder or whatever because that's really important. So be strong and confident with who you are really which you are doing yeah yeah trying. there you go and you're being happy as well going yeah. through it all now that's so great um vanessa thank you so much for coming in to talk to me thank uh, hopefully you. everyone will seek inspiration from this and onwards and upwards uh, hopefully see you on next season of dancing on ice who knows fingers crossed who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers uh and if anyone wants to check you out it's vanessa bauer underscore skates on instagram right exactly yeah and you've got a youtube channel as well i do yeah so there we go Great. Vanessa, thank you so much for coming to speak to me today on Headstrong. Thank you for inviting me here. Pleasure. Absolutely. There we go. So a huge, huge thank you to Vanessa for coming to chat to me on the podcast. I think we can all agree that it's incredibly brave to be able to speak so openly about her experiences throughout her career, both as a pro and in the public eye. If you like the podcast, please do subscribe, go rate us and even tell other people about the podcast. We want to get as many listeners as possible to join us on this journey to becoming headstrong. A huge thank you to Jack Graham Thomas for his perseverance with dealing with me on the technical side of things, to Jack Huxley, Lizzie Price, Ollie Aziz, Nathan and Ben at the Umbrella Rooms, Cozzy and of course Vanessa for coming onto the podcast. All that's left for me to say is don't forget to tune in next Wednesday for my next episode.